The 1998 Bicentennial of the Town of Onondaga is a celebration of the people who have lived, loved, and worked in this beautiful part of Onondaga County for the past 200 years. For illustrations of early Onondaga before the advent of photography, we are fortunate to have the paintings of George Casson Knapp, first professor of drawing and painting at Syracuse University from 1873 to 1879. He was born October 29, 1833, on a farm on Onondaga Hill, only a mile from the Indian Reservation. Bakai's Road was Knapp Street then, the series of historical paintings called Pioneers of Onondaga was begun at the turn of this century when Knapp was nearly 70 years old. The original boundaries of the town stretched northward to include the tip of Onondaga Lake. In this first painting, beginning the salt industry, we see the lake in the background. And our first settler, Ephraim Webster, watches as Comfort Tyler chops wood and as Asa Danforth carries brine from the spring to be boiled over the roaring fire. This was the year 1788 and the beginning of the industry which made Onondaga famous and gave Syracuse its nickname, the Salt City. At the close of the Revolutionary War, the central and western portions of New York State were still considered the wilderness by the settlers of New England and eastern New York, which had been populated for nearly 200 years. But this area was known to the many soldiers who had marched and made forays through the Onondaga country during the war. At this time, Congress needed land to honor her promises of bounties to men who had served in New York regiments during the war for independence. The first of a series of treaties under which the state acquired title to most of the lands of the Onondaga and Cayuga nations was concluded at Rome in September 1788. These two areas, surveyed into 600 acre lots, became the military tract of New York State. Immediately after the first patents for these bounty lands were granted in July 1790, new families began to arrive and take up the arduous task of clearing the forest to establish farms and homes. The town of Onondaga was the only town in Onondaga County which was not part of the military tract, but was originally a part of the Onondaga and Salt Springs reservations. In this next painting of the series, we look out over Onondaga Hollow on a fall afternoon in 1800. Ephraim Webster, in Indian buckskins, enters the scene. Webster had arrived in the valley in 1788 and set up his trading post on the shore of Onondaga Creek. Comfort Tyler turns from his compass and level to greet him. Their friend, Asa Danforth, strikes his axe into the stump of the tree he's burning. An Onondaga chief, quietly smoking his pipe, has been closely observing the strange proceedings, puzzled, perhaps, by the surveyor's division of a farm lot. His people held their land as common property. No individual Indian owned ground from which he could permanently exclude another member of his nation. A hunter with bow and quiver pauses to look over Danforth's work. As an Indian woman, heavily burdened, trudges up the hill. A horseman with saddlebags adequate for all the weekly mail passing between Whitestown and the young settlements to the west rides up the narrow road. He'll be replaced within a year by a teamster and wagon as the volume of mail increases. Danforth's Tavern appears in the middle distance over Danforth's head. It stood on the east bank of the creek, opposite what would become Heath Park. Near the right edge of the painting, we see Tyler's home. This is where the Betts Branch Library now stands on South Salina Street. Webster's Red House is in the distance above. 
The Bostwick cobblestone house was built in front of this on Valley Drive next to Webster's Pond. Comfort Tyler is again the central figure in this painting. The young salt maker and surveyor we saw in the previous paintings has served his community as the first postmaster in the county, a captain of militia, a member of the state assembly, and as sheriff and county clerk. Now in 1803, as landlord of the principal tavern on the Seneca Turnpike Road, he steps forward to greet a group of travelers arriving from the east. The Turnpike Road is still very new. Soon heavy wagons and 15 to 20 coaches will pass through the hollow every day. But now in 1803, the coach is a novelty, exciting the curiosity of a group of Onondaga Indians as much as it does that of passing riders. And the family whose ox cart has stopped in the narrow East Road, which is now called Salina Street. In 1879, when O.A. Russell was proprietor of this tavern, he called it the Valley House and advertised it as a quiet, healthy summer resort with a streetcar passing every two hours. This building burned in October 1901. A proud day in Onondaga Hollow near the end of the War of 1812 is recorded in this next painting. Colonel Comfort Tyler, after service as Assistant Commissary General, characteristically stands with axe in hand, looking out over the community that has grown up around the fields he and Asa Danforth first cleared in the wilderness only a quarter century previously. The village, with its 65 or more houses, stretches for a mile along the turnpike from East Hill to West. It has been a trying year for the pioneers at Onondaga and others on the frontier, as word came of defeats along the borders and of the burning of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. But for today, housework, business, chores, hunting and social calls in the hollow are interrupted by the sound of drums as a detachment of troops escorts a long column of British prisoners eastward from the Niagara frontier. As the vanguard reaches the foot of the hill, it wheels right, following a mounted officer into George Olmsted's field to make camp for the night. John Gridley's impressive stone house, along with Job Tyler's and Deacon Joseph Swan's houses on the north side of the turnpike, and George Olmsted's two-story home opposite them, survive all the changes and hazards of coming decades and still stand today to celebrate our town's bicentennial. At the right from its terrace on the East Hill, the Onondaga Arsenal dominates the scene. The stout stone building, 50 feet by 25 feet, was constructed in 1810 of limestone blocks quarried from the hill behind. The wooden cannon on its roof proclaimed its purpose as a storehouse for the arms, ammunition, equipment, and supplies the militia would need when they were called upon to defend New York's extensive northern and western frontier. Although preparations were made, there never were any battles fought in Onondaga County. The arsenal was used only for the storage of arms and a stopover for troops. This painting depicts the visit of Lafayette on June 9, 1825, as he passed through Onondaga Hill during his triumphant visit back to the lands he helped defend during the Revolutionary War. The first Onondaga County Courthouse was erected on the hill in 1802 in the public square laid out by James Geddes. The square at this time was covered with a heavy growth of timber and the citizens of the hill had a bee to cut away the trees to make room for the new building. Temporary floors and seats were added to the second floor so that county court could be held there. By 1804, the courtroom and dwelling on the second floor were completed, although the cells for the jail were not finished until 1810. The first jailer was James Beebe, who was elected in 1802. B.B. was a Revolutionary War veteran, a captain in George Washington's army. While serving as jailer, he was also appointed to the post of custodian of the arsenal on the East Hill. In 1812, when returning from attending to duties relating to this office, he drowned in the Seneca River. 
he was 60 years old. During his funeral, several debtors escaped from the jail on the hill. It was the custom of the time that the jailer who let prisoners escape was responsible for his debts. And since a new jailer had not yet been appointed, Beebe's heirs paid the debts of the prisoners who had escaped. With the advent of the Erie Canal, the seat of county government was moved from the hill to Salina in 1830, and the courthouse building was then used as a schoolhouse. The last building on this site, a two-story schoolhouse built in 1890, was converted into the present town hall in 1954. In front of the courthouse was the small stone building which housed the county clerk's office. To the east, we see the Upper Tavern, built in 1803 by Josiah Bronson. While the county seat was on the hill, the taverns were busy places, furnishing lodgings and meals for the attorneys and judges, as well as for the people who came to the hill to have their cases tried. I imagine many a court case was discussed over a pint at the Bronson Tavern, which was conveniently next door to the courthouse. This tavern building burned to the ground in the late 1800s, but was immediately rebuilt. That second building was used for many years as a store, a post office, a pub, but was demolished in 1985 to make way for the new Burn Dairy store parking lot. In 1824, at the invitation of Congress, the Franco-American patriot Lafayette visited every state and nearly every city in the Union. He came with considerable haste through central New York, traveling both day and night in order to be in Boston for the laying of the cornerstone of the Bunker Hill Monument. When only 20 years of age, the Marquis de Lafayette, already a major general in the French army, had equipped a ship and sailed to America to help the colonies in their struggle for independence. The aid he gave, both financially and as a soldier, proved invaluable. The year following the Treaty of Peace, 1784, he made a first triumphal tour of the U.S. Forty years later, he again crossed the ocean to America as the nation's guest. Lafayette landed in New York on August 15, 1824. From that time until his departure for his homeland one year later, he was conducted from city to city by committees of local dignitaries and was feted with a series of receptions, entertainments, and celebrations such as had never been equaled in American history. The Marquis, traveling with his son, George Washington Lafayette, and their retinue started across New York State from Buffalo on an evening in early June 1825. The next few days took them by coach and by boat through Black Rock, the Falls, Fort Niagara, past workers on the Erie Canal, through Lockport, Rochester, Canandaigua, Geneva, Waterloo, Seneca Falls, Auburn, and then on to Skinny Atlas, arriving about midnight to a resounding salute fired from a boat anchored off the bridge. Continuing down Seneca Turnpike, the party proceeded towards Syracuse where, according to schedule, it should have arrived many hours before. At Onondaga Hill, nearly all of the villagers and neighbors from the surrounding countryside had gathered at 10 o'clock at the courthouse in anticipation of the general's arrival, but then, disappointed, had returned to their homes. This painting shows Lafayette, in the coach being welcomed by Judge Strong, General Wood, General Ellis, and quite a few citizens who had been regathered in the square. Despite the late hour, Judge Strong delivered an oration from the porch of the tavern and Lafayette the hero was cheered on his way by the happy residents of Onondaga Hill. In this bicentennial year of 1998, the town of Onondaga covers 65 square miles of sprawling farmland and suburban areas sprouting new residential developments. Onondaga is the home of the Onondaga Free Library, Onondaga Community College, Onondaga County Fire Control, Community General Hospital, Van Dyne Home and Hospital, and is served by eight fire departments and seven school districts.
Happy birthday to all of us. The people of South Onondaga, Navarino, Taunton, Howlett Hill, Nedro, Southwood, Sentinel Heights, Onondaga Hill, Split Rock, Cedar Vale, and all points in between. Remembering our past, shaping our future.